Um, yes, let me just uh, briefly introduce myself. I'm a historian of science. I'm working in the, in the history of the physical sciences, so-called, which apart from physics, I take to be chemistry, astronomy and cosmology. Um, so I, I uh, have prepared recently a, a paper on um, the historical origins of the concept of big science. It will be published next year only. Um, and uh, the purpose of this uh, small talk of mine today is that I'll say a few words about the concept, uh, mainly in order to emphasize uh, its diversity. There are many different kinds of big sciences, so to speak. And also to point out that although the term is fairly modern, it uh, has had its origin in the early 1960s. Uh, and although the prototypical examples of um, a big science is to be found in high energy physics, experimental, and in uh, the, um, uh, the space sciences and things like that, uh, then the concept of big science is not restricted to these sciences. And uh, nor is it restricted to post-World War II science it can be found far back in science. And I think it's useful to address this question in a historical perspective. In any case, that is what I will do. Uh, yes, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yes. <laughs> okay, yes. I have listed here uh, what I take to be the standard criteria of what it means to be, have it to, for a pro project being a uh, big science. Uh, it's typically that such projects are very expensive, so expensive that they normally cannot be privately funded, but has to involve government. Also, they usually, well, in fact, always, I say, include a big staff where uh, the scientists, the working scientists are only part of the personnel managers, engineers, and I don't know what, are very much part of it too. Uh, third, uh, often, but certainly not always, they're centered around a big, sophisticated machine, such as is the case in CERN, of course, with the accelerators and detector systems. Uh, and again, uh, like in CERN, it's a centralized system of big uh, laboratories. However, the point is, that uh, none of these criteria are really sufficient. I would say that they are very reasonable cr criteria. They apply to uh, many cases of big science, but definitely not to all of them. Uh, so I would like to illustrate sort of different kinds of big science uh, through going, by going through a couple of historical examples, some of which may not be well known, but others uh, which are typically a big science project. And the first one I want to focus on, new slide please. As you, many of you will know, um, yeah, my, my first example goes back to uh, uh, the Enlightenment period in the 18th century. I just need to have the next slide. But it's not there. Pierre Andrea, are you working? On the next slide? No, no, the, the you you're too fast. Go upward, please. There it is. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so this is a reference to one of the um, uh, very interesting and major scientific projects during the Enlightenment period. Uh, as many of you will uh, will know, um, the the aim of this project, which involved governments uh, throughout Europe and hundreds of astronomers, was to determine the distance, the average distance from the sun to the uh, to the Earth, the so-called astronomical uh, unit. And uh, that was done in uh, 1671 and 1679. 
when planet Venus transited over the surface of the sun, and by measuring uh, Venus's transit times, one could establish uh, this important astronomical parameter. What's interesting about this project is that it definitely is big science. It involved practically all working astronomers uh, in this period. On the other hand, it did not uh, rely on or involve any kind of advanced instrumentation. Uh, the kind of telescopes people observed the sun with were quite ordinary telescopes. On the other hand, uh, it relied on numerous observations, not only at a particular place, but throughout the globe. So expeditions were sent to all over the globe. And the, from the collection of these data, um, uh, people in France uh, found the more or less the present value of the astronomical union. Uh, it's also interesting that contrary to some other big science projects, especially modern big science projects, this one was almost purely scientific. In spite of the vast expenses which are used on, the, uh, on, on this project, uh, it, 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 was, it had a scientific aim, not a economic or commercial aim. Let me move ahead in, in time. Next slide, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, now we are up in the early 20th century, about 1910, and I'm referring to a very important physics laboratory in the Dutch city of Leiden, which was directed by Heike Kameling Onnes, a Nobel Prize laureate, who established the world's leading low temperature laboratory and for a period of time, for more than 10 years, this was the only facility in the world able to produce liquid helium and to uh, produce the many discoveries which were associated with liquid helium, such as the most important one probably being the discovery of superconductivity, an amazing and quite unexpected discovery dating from 1911, and a couple of years later, we have also enlightened the discovery of, of um, superfluidity and so forth. When this laboratory uh, qualifies as big science, it's because of its complex structure. Uh, it, it was not centered about a single big machine, but on several machines. And it was very important. It was crucial for, for Kameling Honest Laboratory that it involved a lot of skilled engineers and managers, which in the running of the laboratory were quite as important as the scientists themselves. But, yes, next slide, please. On the other hand, um, at least from a modern perspective, uh, big science is closely associated with high energy physics, which means nuclear and subnuclear physics, a branch of physics which emerged after 1932 or so. And that was the, the prototypical example of a big science machine is, of course, Ernest Lawrence's famous cyclotron, which he and his collaborators invented and developed in a number of new versions in California. The first version is from 1931. Here we have the second generation cyclotron uh, being able to accelerate protons up to an energy of 10 MeV. Um, of course, the cyclotron and, and similar machines became huge, hugely successful in, in uh, nuclear and high energy physics. They were originally, they were very much an American technology, but they were exported to Russia, Japan, uh, Europe, and, 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 and elsewhere. So, um, Within uh, one or two decades, we have much larger machines, but basically built on the same kind of principles. The lower picture we see here is a so-called synchrocyclotron. We are up in 1954, a period in, in which uh, American high in a, the, the American physicists almost completely dominated the field of high energy physics uh, one reason for it, the American domination, 
was that they uh, had these uh, bit machines and they were very big. Compare the original 10 EV protons with the 6.2 uh, giga EV protons from this uh, machine. So, uh, yes, let me have the next slide, please. Okay, uh, here we have moved up to the 1950s uh, with a different type of uh, technology, but still based on the, on the design of the original synchrotron. And again, one of the, uh, one of the, the, the inventions flowing from uh, California, from the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. And as one can easily see, this is big science in, in, in all respects of this work. It involved a huge amount of high quality iron, 10,000 tons and was able to uh, deliver protons up to 6.2 giga electron volts. Now, uh, it's not always that big science projects result in, in good science, in the sense that some of the uh, big investments in big science, sometimes they only give a, a very modest uh, output of uh, fundamental science or, or scientific discovery is sometimes not, not at all. But in the present case, uh, this big machine was able almost immediately to solve some of the puzzles of fundamental physics. People had known for uh, quite some time that, uh, that um, there should exist antiprotons just as well as there should anti-electrons. So everyone expected that the positive correction, the negative proton existed, um, but it hadn't been found. It was predicted by Dirac way back in 1933. Um, but in one of the early experiments with the Beavertron, uh, not only was the anti-proton uh, discovered and analyzed, but also the anti-neutron, which uh, revealed its, its existence uh, in the same kind of experiments. And so uh, these experiments resulted in a Nobel Prize in 1959. I could go on, of course, to speak about still uh, more energetic uh, accelerators and, and detector systems that time doesn't allow. And uh, so I would use my time to point out that the knowledge, the scientific knowledge flowing from our big science projects is one thing, and of course, from a scientific point of view, is the important thing. Uh, but it's not the only change uh, in the world of science which happens as, as a result of big science facilities. Uh, because the advent of big science, say 1960 plus, which has, of course, accelerated over time, uh, also meant a change relationship between man and machine. Not only between man and machine, but also between the individual and the often very large teams in which the individual was only one small part. We have a, a very interesting, I would even say shocking, uh, illustration of this in the next slide. The next slide, here we are, yes. This is a quotation from Samuel Gauchschmidt. As many all of you will know, Gauchschmidt is mostly famous for being a co-discovery of the concept of spin back in 1925. But at the time, he was uh, a very important part of the American scientific establishment. He was director of the Brookhaven uh, Cosmotron, a huge uh, accelerator. And in a memorandum from 1956, he says to the scientists that you can re read on the screen, what he says is, of course, that I shall reserve the right to refuse experimental work to any member of my staff I deem unfit for group collaboration. And then he says, essentially, that what this science is about 
is not about scientists, it's not about human beings, it's basically about the machine. After all, he says, not you, but the machine that creates the particle and events which you investigate with such great seal. So that is one of the consequences which we still very much experience today. That is the, um, the focus on the machine and the corresponding lack of focus on the individual scientist, which uh, has which can be illustrated also in a different way. And the reason is that with big science projects involving hundreds or thousands of collaborators, then also the scientific publication changes markedly. Um, in the old days, in the days of Rutherford and Lawrence, they were typically one, two, three, maybe four authors, even for an experimental paper. Today, it is very, very different. And uh, let me illustrate this with the last of my slides. Yes, here it is. Uh, this is the first page of an of a article from, uh, from 1906, I think it is, yes. Uh, it's from an experiment made in CERN, and what this experiment is about is uh, it doesn't really matter. But this is the first page with all the authors alphabet alphabetically listed, and it continues over the next couple of pages. And still, this experiment with this many authors, 657, that is peanuts uh, compared to modern experimental papers, primarily in high energy physics, but also in space science uh, and also in other branches, even in the biological sciences, we have this phenomenon uh, which is called hyper-authorship, uh, which is usually taken to be papers uh, with more than 1,000 authors, which is a new thing, but today is not very exceptional. It is exceptional, but um, uh, in the last decade or so, more than 1,000 papers have been published with nominally 10, more than 1,000 authors. And when I say nominally, of course, I mean that, that these, these are, in a, in a formal way of speaking, they are authors, but they are not authors in any practical or real sense. The present record was set in 2015, again, based on a, CERN experiment where the uh, physicists tried to establish uh, the, um, the, the, the mass of the Higgs boson. That was a huge, uh, a, a huge project. And um, the paper which, which appeared uh, in the European Journal of Physics, I think it was, included no less than 5,154 authors, which is a grotesque number of course. So uh, I don't know whether this is good or bad. Uh, from my point of view, it's more bad than it's good, but one may have different opinions of, of, of that, of course. Uh, evidently, it means that the individual author is completely anonymous. Uh, and when you refer to a paper like this one, in, in physics, they have the, the convention that all the authors are listed alph alphabetically. So it's very good to have a name like Abbott or something like that, and even better with double A. Uh, but it's impossible to say from such a huge list of, of names what the various persons did. And it's very difficult to uh, to credit an individual with a particular paper and the other way around, if something is wrong with a paper, who is to be responsible? So there are indeed um, practical as well as ethical problems with this kind of hyper-authorship and with big science in general. And with these remarks, I will end my talk. Thank you. Yes, that, that is, uh, you, you, I have ended it. 
Thank you very much, Helge. I was saying very instructive, very interesting. Uh, it is actually, at least I'm speaking for myself, it is a topic that is not, that I'm not, I was not very familiar with. And uh, thank you, because there are several, several key issues that are related to these uh, um, points that you explained clearly. Uh, more recently, uh, the editorial uh, scientific, I mean, the, the, the scientific publishing uh, started recognizing the personal credits to the different researchers in uh, articles. Actually, again, as an author, sometimes this uh, sounds bothersome or, you know, a waste of time, but actually, after your uh, uh, presentation, it is uh, more and more clear how important this is. Uh, yes, I, I, perhaps I should mention that uh, the um, the order of the authors is, of course, conventional, yeah. and that uh, different sciences apparently have different conventions. Uh, this convention with with alphabetical listing, they 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 certainly have in particle physics, but I know that in other branches, in geology, for instance, uh, they 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 have uh, a different system. Um, and also, um, as I said, but some of you may know, um, these kind of, of very big projects with thousands of, um, of, of scientists or authors, uh, they are also known in some aspect, in, in, in some areas of the biological sciences. Um, we have an early example of it in the so-called Hugo project, the Human Genome Project. So they exist in biology and space science, but uh, but my question to you perhaps is that whether there are similar examples in chemistry. I'm not aware of them. I mean, uh, our scientific papers on chemistry with approximately 1,000 or even more authors, they may not exist, I don't know. Yeah, I think that your answer is uh, also uh answer uh, what Adin and Rennie was asking. Uh, he was asking, an author is often said to have responsibility for the content of the paper. How is that compatible with uh, hyper-authorship? Uh, as I see it, 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 it's not very compatible. Yeah. And, and, and uh, as we know, I mean, one, one thing is to be credited for a big science project that creates problems, of course, for uh, the Nobel Prize institution, for instance. Uh, you can only share a Nobel Prize between three scientists. It, it's not possible to give more than three scientists a, a prize. So when some of these, and some of these big uh, projects in high energy physics have been awarded the Nobel Prize, and then typically they take the, uh, the, the, the leaders of the team, or, but, 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 but uh, in practice, it means that it, the entire group receives this prize, uh, not in terms of money, of course, but in terms of credit, which is um, smeared out. And so, so, so the fraction of credit uh, per author will actually be very small. And the other problem is, of course, the responsibility because if it turns out that one of these big projects um, goes wrong in the sense that people later discover that some of the claims are wrong and it may even have to be, re to, to be uh, redrawn from publication, uh, who should be blamed? And there have been such cases. Yeah. 